Hello, my name is Scott Manich, a professor of church history here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois, and the secretary of the Christ on Campus Initiative Ministry. Christ on Campus Initiative is a Christian ministry that commissions and distributes literature and media materials for college students and university students addressing an array of contemporary hot button topics from a Christian perspective. These resources are developed by leading evangelical scholars. In this video, sponsored by Christ on Campus Initiative, we're very pleased to hear from one of these distinguished scholars, Dr. Craig Blomberg, on the topic of the historical Jesus. Dr. Blomberg is a distinguished professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary, where he's taught since 1986. He has authored uh, or edited over 20 different books, including most recently, The Historical Reliability of the Gospels in 2007, and Jesus and the Gospels in Introduction and Survey in 2009. Dr. Blomberg, thanks for being with us today. It's my privilege. Uh, Dr. Blomberg, uh, outside of the New Testament, what documentary evidence do historians have for the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, what does this evidence tell us? We have all kinds of evidence written by other Christians in the earliest decades of the second century after the New Testament was complete. But usually somebody asking that kind of question is asking what kind of non-Christian evidence do we have? Um, concern that perhaps uh, Christians were biased and uh, therefore wanting to make sure that we can prove Jesus existed was something like what Christians claim he was uh, from other ancient Jewish, Greek, Roman sources. There are about a dozen such references to Jesus. By far the fullest one comes from a late first century Jewish historian named Josephus but we find early second century writers in the Roman world like Tacitus and Suetonius. We find references in the encyclopedic sized collection of uh, Jewish traditions known as the Talmud uh, and elsewhere. And from them, we can uh, corroborate that Jesus was uh, a Jewish teacher who lived uh, in the first third of the first century who uh, had a ministry that intersected with that of a man named John who baptized people and hence got the name John the Baptizer, that he was born out of wedlock, that he had disciples, five of whom are named, uh, who were particularly close followers, that he, he regularly got in trouble with certain Jewish authorities of his time for uh, radical views about the law and that he finally was crucified. We know that from Tacitus in the second century under the governorship of Pontius Pilate, which narrows the time frame to uh, the mid uh, 20s to the mid 30s of the first century. And that uh, despite that ignominious death, his followers believed that they saw him raised from the dead and believed that he was the Messiah, the Jewish liberator, beginning very quickly even to worship him as if he were a god, to use the language of Pliny in the early second century. So even without touching a Christian source, there's quite a bit we can know about Jesus. Now, some people would question the reliability of the gospels, which for sure give a much fuller account of the life and ministry of Jesus. How would you respond to the suggestions that the writers of the Gospels embellished the account of Jesus' life, uh, turning a simple Jewish prophet into a kind of Gentile God? How would you respond to that concern? We have uh, remarkably ancient uh, testimony, remarkably close in time to the life of Jesus. Probably the earliest written Gospel was Mark, most likely written in the 60s of the first century, with Jesus having died in about AD 30. A 30 year period may seem like a, a long span of time to us, but in the ancient world, which was an oral culture, 
when people memorized and passed on faithfully for generations the beliefs and traditions and narratives of their families, tribes, nations, with high degrees of care and accuracy, one generation is a very short period of time. There were still plenty of eyewitnesses living in Israel who could remember the historical Jesus, what he was really like, many of whom had not become his followers. The entire Christian claim could have been very easily debunked early on if there had been widespread embellishment and uh, misrepresentation of who Jesus was. Dr. Blomberg, uh, in his book, The Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown has drawn attention to the importance of the so-called Gnostic Gospels in early Christianity. Would you tell us something about these Gnostic Gospels and do you think they shed significant light on the historic Jesus of Nazareth? I suppose the first thing that, that needs to be said for people who may never have actually seen one of these documents is that they are not gospels in the sense of being narratives of a significant percentage of Jesus' ministry the way Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are. The vast majority of the so-called Gnostic gospels are supposed secret revelations after Jesus' resurrection to one or more disciples by Jesus. And they tend to discourse on things utterly unlike the Jesus of the New Testament gospels, reflecting on the origins of the universe, the angelic hierarchies, why the world was created, uh, how sin came to be, uh, an abstract theological reflection very different from what we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is one Gnostic gospel, the Gospel of Thomas, which also is not a, a consecutive narrative. It's just 114 sayings linked together, uh, attributed to Jesus, that does have significant overlap with the Jesus of the New Testament, maybe as many as a third of the sayings. Uh, attributed to Jesus in this uh, account uh, remind readers of something that they would read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But then another large collection, maybe up to half of the sayings, are quite different. This philosophical speculation that Gnosticism was so known for. And then tantalizingly, the remainder could be taken in a, an Orthodox Christian direction, could be taken in a, a Gnostic direction. They're short and cryptic enough that it's hard to know for sure. But does Thomas or any of these other gospels give us solid historical information that would change our understanding of who Jesus of Nazareth was? No, not at all. Do you find that many neighbors, friends that you interact with have had a, uh, a skewed perspective on the early church because of books like Dan Brown's. And what would you want to say to them specifically? Yes, um, a surprising number of people, uh, whether they picked it up from Brown or from somebody else of his ilk or by word of mouth that garbled Brown who garbled the ancient church. Um, I would want to say that uh, what competed with Orthodox Christianity in the early years was very different, was later than the New Testament documents, and was pretty easily dismissed. It did not become some lingering controversy that the so-called lost gospels were not for the most part suppressed as some claim, they simply fell out of use because they weren't of value to the vast majority of early Christians. My friend Daryl Bach, who teaches at Dallas Seminary, likes to say it's true that sometimes winners rewrite history. But it's also true that sometimes winners deserve to win. And uh, 
all evidence points to the fact that apostolic Orthodox Christianity was the dominant Christian tradition that had carefully preserved the life of Christ and its significance. And that's what deserved to be passed on and to be preserved. Well, as we close, can you tell us in a nutshell why we should believe in the historicity of Jesus and what that means for us today? We should believe in the historicity of Jesus because even if we're skeptical about all Christian testimony, there is enough non-Christian testimony to corroborate his existence and the main contours of his life. But then we shouldn't be so skeptical uh, about all Christian testimony because much of it represented the testimony of people who were not born into Christian families, but who were adult converts convinced by the evidence, convinced by the transmission of the stories and accounts of Jesus that he was so significant they should become believers and followers in him. You can't just write all that evidence off because somebody was convinced by it. And that significance continues to this day. In all the world religions, in all the traditions of philosophers and teachers, nowhere else has someone made the claim in actions and in labels that he applied to himself and in explicit teachings that he was somehow so close to God that those out of his culture and religion who believed in God at times accused him of blasphemy, executed him, and yet was reported to have been seen again bodily by more than 500 of his followers who then began an unbroken tradition of following him and at a very early date, even worshiping him as that God. There's no other religion or worldview that has that package of events. You have to come to grips with who Jesus of Nazareth was. And if you look at the evidence, it, it might just transform your life for the good. Well, Dr. Blomberg, thank you so much for speaking with us today. And we hope this conversation was helpful to all of you. A fuller discussion of this issue is available in an essay written by Dr. Craig Blomberg titled, Jesus of Nazareth, How Historians Can Know Him and Why It Matters. That essay is available for free online at thegospelcoalition.org slash CCI or at henrycenter.org. Christ on Campus Initiative provides additional essays by top scholars addressing such issues as sexuality, pluralism, Islam, human flourishing, and the new atheism. We encourage you to check out these resources online. Christ on Campus Initiative is a nonprofit organization generously supported by the Carl F.H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, the Gospel Coalition, and the Mac Foundation. Thanks for, again for being with us today.